Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, this uh, Municipality of Leamington Community Engagement Session for the Windsor-Essex Regional Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan. Thank you so much for coming. Really can't tell you how much we appreciate you being here and giving your time uh, on a weeknight for this uh, important purpose. Um, if I can just have the, uh, the land acknowledgement page. Um, if we go, we're uh, meeting digitally. Uh, it's our practice to acknowledge the lands. And so today we meet on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, which includes the Ojibwa, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. And for those of us who gather in Leamington, we acknowledge the traditional territories of the Caldwell First Nations. We respect the longstanding relationships with First Nations people in this place in the 100 mile Windsor -Essex, Penin Windsor Essex Peninsula and the Straits des Trois of Detroit. So if we could just have the next slide, we'll have a quick video uh, welcome from the project leads. Hello, on behalf of all of us at the Windsor-Essex Regional Community Safety and Wellbeing Systems Leadership Table, we want to thank you for your interest in the development of our region's first ever community safety and wellbeing plan. Together, our goal is to build a community where everyone feels safe, has a sense of belonging, has access to services and opportunities, and can have their needs met across the region. We want to hear from you. We want to understand what your priorities and concerns are for the safety and well being of our community so that we can create a plan to advance the interests of all residents across Windsor and the County of Essex. So please make your voice heard by participating in our online survey or by registering for one of the virtual public meetings happening in each of the region's eight municipalities. To get involved, visit us online at cswbwindsoressex.ca. And thank you from all of us. So uh, just a few initial housekeeping matters to make sure that everybody uh, is comfortable and enjoys a, a fun, productive evening. Uh, most important thing is to try to remember to keep yourself on mute unless you're speaking. And you can do that either with the mute button that you'll find at the bottom left corner of the, uh, uh, of the screen, or you can also use it with the mute button on your phone or your computer if that's what you're using. Uh, we will be your partners in keeping you muted. Uh, we can, if, if, if you're having a dog barking in the background or something, as we all know that can happen these days, uh, uh, we, will, we will be quick to mute you. But I want you to know we'll be equally quick to unmute you uh, because really tonight's about hearing from you. Uh, the, uh, uh, if you wish to uh, make a comment through the chat feature, you're welcome to do so. Uh, but with a nice small group that we have, it will be very possible to have a good interactive conversation. So uh, what, when we break out into that format, you can either, either use the raise hand function, but frankly, uh, this works really well too. Uh, and so uh, uh, just unmuting and, and trying to just, uh, you know, graciously inserting yourself in just like we were all at a, din a dining room table together. Uh, I should just mention that uh, this is a community safety and well-being plan and the safe zone for talking and sharing with everybody has to start here. Uh, so we will be monitoring the discussion and reserve the right to delete any comments or remove any participants that are making inappropriate comments. I should say though that we've uh, run a number of these meetings already and the one thing that's become absolutely clear is that anybody who's kind enough to give their time to the process isn't here for any reason other than to share their thoughts. And we've certainly not had to do that even once and we don't expect to tonight in uh, Leamington. Uh, we do have the services of a closed captioner. And if you require live closed captioning for the meeting, um, uh, you can enable it at the bottom of your screen by hitting the little CC button. Uh, you'll see also that one of, one of us here is labeled CSWB Windsor. Uh, that's Lindsay Rive. And uh, you, she, you can just hit a re response to her in the chat box if you have any technical issues of any kind and she can get you straightened away. I should just make one other comment about cameras. It's actually great how many of you have your cameras on. That's terrific. Uh, if for whatever reason you prefer to not have your camera on, frankly, that's fine too. Uh, do whatever's comfortable. It's sort of nice to be able to see everybody, but 
uh, it is you know important for us to say that these uh, videos of these sessions will ultimately be posted, and so it's important uh, that you do whatever makes you feel safe and comfortable in the process. Uh, if I can have the next slide, we're happy to say that we're just about through the, uh, uh, the introductory uh, aspects of this. Uh, what we'll be doing by way of an agenda tonight is as soon as uh, uh, we'll, we'll have a quick uh, briefing on the overarching purpose of community safety and well being plans and the process that's going through. And then there'll be a quick opportunity for questions about the process. But we're going to move through that quickly and get into breakout sessions uh, where you will have a chance to uh, tell us your thoughts about community safety uh, in Leamington. And uh, so basically we'll break out and, and this will all happen through the magic of uh, uh, digital uh, stuff happening automatically. So don't worry about any of the mechanics of it, but we'll be able to have a conversation just like we were at the dinner table together. And then we'll come back and have a report back uh, much as we would if we were doing this in a traditional style in a face-to-face -face meeting. Uh, if I could just have the next slide, uh, just a couple of brief introductions. Uh, notwithstanding the obvious, the obvious uh, fraudulent character of that photograph, which depicts me with much shorter hair, I can confirm that I am in fact still John Madison uh, with my uh, enhanced COVID hair supply. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, Olivia LaHaye. We are both from Strategy Corp and we uh, are working as facilitators for the project. Uh, we're here with from Windsor, from uh, Workforce Windsor Essex. We're here with Lindsay Rive, who I've already mentioned is our IT support, uh, Ms. Michelle Sushu, uh, and from the city of Windsor, uh, Leo Gill. Uh, Leo is going to uh, provide you with a summary of the process. So over to you, Leo. Thank you very much, John. Um, so yes, and thank you all for uh, coming tonight. We really do appreciate your time and, uh, and, and you being all here. Um, so I'd like to kind of start off with just asking and, and explaining the first question here that may be on your minds. What is community safety and well-being planning? And, you know, it is truly about creating a collaborative approach to service delivery, one that involves multiple sectors and community partners and is focused on being proactive and preventative, all for the goal of addressing local priorities related to crime and complex social issues. And to do this, municipal and regional leaders uh, are working with partners across several different fields with the goal of creating a community where everyone feels safe, has a sense of belonging, has access to services and opportunities, and can have their needs met. I like to point out here that uh, uh, what's, what's kind of important about these goals, as well as the approach itself, is that it's recognizing that there are factors that influence our feelings of safety and well-being that go beyond whether a crime has occurred. It can be stigma, it can be discrimination, even a lack of access to resources. And in addition to that too, the approach recognizes that for every risk, there's a community strength and asset, and that these should be your building blocks or starting blocks. And then finally, that everyone has a role to play in improving our safety and well-being. So another question that's asked is, why are we undertaking this project now? And uh, over the past two decades, provincial data and research focusing on how to address some of today's really complex and complicated social challenges um, have really highlighted the importance of crime prevention and prevention in general. Um, and also the importance of strengthening communities and involving different sectors and different partners in the solution making process. And based on this research in 2018, uh, the provincial government passed legislation that required all municipalities to prepare and adopt a CSWD plan. Um, beyond the fact that it is legislated, there's a lot of great local benefits um, and for developing these plans. that will be going over in just a, a, a few seconds. Uh, but first, uh, next slide, please. I, I just wanna jump into a little bit about the, the um, framework here that we're using. Um, and in general, the, the framework is identifying four different areas where we can intervene. We can intervene at the top in the uh, social development layer, that green layer of these uh, four concentric circles. We can also intervene at prevention, risk intervention and incident response itself. And commonly, when we think of safety interventions, we tend to focus on that red portion of that, uh, that bullseye, so to speak, at the incident itself, and tend to approach it from a policing or an emergency services perspective. But research is showing that first responders are really being called to situations related to well-being that are symptoms of larger issues, things like a mental health crisis or housing insecurity. 
And these are issues that first responders can't solve alone. They need to be partnered with uh, and collaborate with other sectors. And so that's something for us to keep in mind. If we move up a layer to risk intervention, this layer is focusing on reducing harm before it gets to the point of an incident. And this type of work is not usually about creating community-wide strategies, and instead is focused on providing things like wraparound services to particular people in need. The next uh, layer, prevention, is really where we all fit in. And it's about proactively identifying and addressing local risks before they escalate. And all community members, groups, and sectors have a, have a strong role to play at this level. And finally, at the very top, that green layer, is social development. And this usually is involving longer term strategies or investments um, to improve larger scale issues like access to income, education, or quality housing, just to name a few. Uh, work in this layer involves us looking beyond the incident at the social causes and understanding that these causes need integrated and collective responses. So if we pull these concepts together, if instead of starting at that red dot at the incident, we started further upstream at the social development layer, then we can work to build on protective factors and strengths. We can emphasize prevention and risk mitigation strategies through things like data, and ultimately work to reduce the number of incidents we need to respond to by intervening before challenges become crises. Uh, next slide, please. So now that we have a bit of background, just wanna jump into the Windsor-Essex approach. The plan will be developed and is being developed in a joint city-county approach. And so while it is being developed through regional collaboration, the plan will include appendices and data profiles for each municipality. And the intent here is to ensure that those local priorities in for, for each municipality are identified and understood. Guiding the plan development for this are two teams here, the Regional Systems Leadership Table and the Enhanced Sector Network. The Systems Leadership Table is made up of leaders from across multiple sectors like health and mental health, education, community and social services, law enforcement, and public safety, to name a few. The Enhanced Sector Network consists of frontline staff and members of, from community organizations and committees that work alongside eight historically underrepresented communities. And those communities include First Nations and Indigenous peoples, uh, racialized persons, newcomers, youth, seniors, 2SLGBTQ plus folk, um, accessibility communities, and broader community groups. And those are community groups that, uh, and committees that tend to work alongside individuals with experienced uh, experiences or lived experience, uh, experiences of uh, house, uh, homelessness uh, or of substance use. And they're both, these two teams are helping us with really kind of narrowing down um, the scope of, of this project and helping us with identifying uh, some of the strategic priorities that we want to start off with. So another thing that they're helping us do is with our objectives, identifying priority risk factors, and identifying strategies to reduce those risk factors, and ultimately to help us set measurable outcomes uh, to ensure that we can track our progress. Next slide. So I mentioned briefly about uh, the plans that these usually provide different benefits. And while you know, what this plan is really aiming to do is take advantage of the great uh, existing strengths that, are, uh, that we have in our communities, the resources and the best practices uh, in our communities to create proactive approaches to address some of these identified local risks. And uh, really what this plan is, seeks to achieve is improve our level of communication and, and collaboration across these different agencies. And in doing so, it really will help us with understanding some of those local risks and vulnerable groups, as well as ensuring that services are provided to individuals with complex needs and increasing our awareness and coordination and access to services for community members and vulnerable groups. Uh, next slide. So lastly here, just to show what the process has been so far, um, I, I do need to say, you know, because of COVID, as with many things, uh, there's a bit of a pro project pause for a period of time, but we relaunched in June 2020. And since the relaunch, we were able to develop a current state data report and an interactive asset map, both of which will be made public in the coming weeks. And uh, really, we were able to complete presentations and forming elected officials of, uh, from each municipality of the project and our progress uh, thus far. And uh, you know, a highlight here through our enhanced sector network, we've been able to engage 96 frontline staff and representatives from existing committees and organizations. And those members have been helping us with contextualizing some of that data that, we, uh, that I mentioned in that data report, uh, as well as being involved in the prioritization process of community risk factors, which is to come. Um, overall, once we've completed the plan consultations uh, uh, that we're doing today, 
uh, and have been able to analyze the data from these consultations and our online survey, for example, will be able to then develop a final report and submit it to municipal and county councils for adoption. Ultimately, we expect for the uh, plan to be fully completed and made public by the end of the year. So with that, I'm just going to open it up to questions. If you have any questions about the process so far um, or, or would like uh, um, to make a comment, that'd be great. Um, I have a question, uh, Fiona. Hi, Fiona. <laughs> How's it going? Um, so um, I participated in the housing and homelessness master plan session similar to this sort of thing as well. And it was wonderfully adopted and supported by council and both city and county council. Um, I'm wondering if there's what, what, what I'm seeing is it got that far and then sort of seems to get stuck in the bureaucratic and even the legal uh, red tape that the city staff are tied to. So if we're uh, so I guess my thought of my, my wonder is, is there a plan to get the plan to actually have teeth um, so that so that once council adopts it, there's legislation that follows or streamlined processes or things happening on this on the bureau on the staffing administrative side that makes action happen. So thank you for that question, Fiona. And, and you know, I share your concerns and share your thoughts in, in that as well. We want to make sure that we have, you know, a, a plan that is uh, effective over the long term and can be implemented. And so one way that we're doing that based on this phase, this is the planning phase of the project where, you know, it's important and vital to get that buy in from not only uh, our community partners, but also our municipal partners. And that's why, you know, making sure that they're informed of the process and engaging them along the way is, is incredibly important to make it so that there is that uh, feeling that this is not just one community that is predominantly, uh, you know, uh, overtaking the project. It's actually a shared and regional collaborative approach. And so again, that is something that's a, a big piece that we're trying to uh, integrate and bake into the process now. Um, it's also why we are engaging our, our community partners through the Enhanced Sector Network to make sure that um, we are listening and understanding some of the, the challenges that, that individuals and different uh, vulnerable populations or historically underrepresented groups uh, are facing. So those pieces in the planning process that we're in right now are really going to help it so that when we get to that implementation phase, once when council endorses the project, we can then really move forward uh, in an effective way and in a collaborative way. <laughs> Thank you, Fiona. Any other questions that uh, we may have? All right, so no worries. What we'll do is we'll go to the next step here, which will be Olivia, who's going to talk about uh, uh, a bit of the data, and then we'll move into the uh, breakout groups. So Olivia, off to you. Thanks, Leo. Uh, so as Leo mentioned, we did complete a current state data report prior to uh, public consultations. And the purpose of that was to help create a baseline to assess safety and well-being in our communities today and to identify points of improvement for the future. Uh, we did this using a number of different types of data sets, including municipal data, including financial and housing services, police service data on things for things like incidents of crime, staff can, and uh, provincial data sets, including things like EQAO. Uh, we looked at a huge, and the reason we looked at this broad range of data sets is because, you know, as Leo mentioned, we're not just looking at incidents of crime here. We're also trying to un better understand the underlying causes of illegal behavior and get and try to fill out that image a bit more broadly. For those who, who can't see the screen, I'll read the categories, the crime and victimization, education, financial security, mental health and substance use, physical health, housing and neighborhoods, and COVID-19, which we acknowledge kind of is its own uh, category, but also has directly impacted all the other ones that I listed before that. Um, so if we just go to the next slide. Uh, so as part of this report, we did create municipal profiles for each municipality in the region. Um, and this include one for Leamington, of course. Uh, one thing I'll, I'll flag before we get into the actual data is, uh, you know, this is a by the numbers approach. It's one perspective. And we have to acknowledge kind of the, the pros and, and cons of, of looking at this data, one of which one 
you know, caveat being it's a census year, which means the most recent census data we have to look at is 2016 data. And that goes for a lot of the data sets um, that might be a little bit outdated and it might not reflect the most current or up to date information available, but it's still worth looking at, it still gives us a, a snapshot of, of the municipality and gives us one perspective that we can help fill out with other, other tools, including public consultations like this one. So if we go to the next slide, please. So, you know, Leamington especially has, has faced a lot of unique challenges, especially recently. You know, the boom in greenhouse and cannabis industries have, have led to massive growth. Um, and uh, Leamington's urban, the needs of Leamington's urban areas uh, have differed drastically from those in its more rural areas. So it faces a number of unique challenges. Um, one of which uh, being crime, you know, the municipality has higher rates of violent property and drug crime uh, compared to regional averages. Uh, and, dub and the crime is a lot more severe than it is in the rest of the region. Um, however, it's worth noting that drug crime uh, specifically has been on the decrease uh, between uh, 2016 and 2019 in particular. And so, you know, again, as we mentioned, it's worth uh, noting the variations in the data and their different timeframes. Educational attainment in the region is below regional or in the area is below regional averages and fewer Residents have a high school diploma or post-secondary degree as of 2016. And residents in the municipality have lower median household income, although child poverty is uh, in line with regional averages, but it is worth noting that it is on the right, it was on the rise as of 2016. Uh, residents in the, in the municipality have a slightly lower rate of home ownership. More people are renting than, than the rest of the region. And it's worth noting in, in Leamington and of course in Windsor as well, uh, the municipality has really high rates of opioid related harm. And so uh, it is something that ha has struck this municipality uh, particularly hard. The municipality uh, has a number, or, or their strategic plan has a number of priorities. Um, we've pulled out some that directly had to do with community safety and well being, and they include economic growth. Through waterfront and uptown development, community improvement plans, and developing uh, and developing or redeveloping derelict buildings, reviewing the policing model to improve public safety, supporting international agricultural workers with housing and other services, developing a water management strategy for flooding and, and drainage of agri-land, and increasing support for mental health, substance use, and poverty alleviation. Um, so that is a, a snapshot of Leamington. Um, now, with that in mind, we, we want to start our breakout room activity. So if we go to the next slide. Oh. Do you want to just go to the, the slide after that, or are we missing a slide there? We might be missing a slide on this one. I apologize. Here, I've got it right here. Uh, so, so everyone has been randomly assigned to a breakout room. Um, we're just going to have uh, discussions in smaller groups, and each group will have probably likely two groups, and each room will have a facilitator in it. And our job is to not only make sure that everyone is able to contribute, but that we get through all the questions we have. We have five questions, so should leave lots of time for, for meaningful discussion and for everyone to get their, their voices heard. Um, afterwards, we'll come back to the main group, and everyone will be able to share what the main themes in each, uh, each group were and we can kind of circle back and give everyone an opportunity to add anything that might have been missed. Um, so with that, um, ensure that you click the join button when it pops up and you'll be sent into your assigned group. See you soon. <laughs>